Sound off for Chesterfield. Chesterfield, first cigarette in America to give you premium quality in both regular and king size, brings you Dragnet. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a robbery detail. You've just rounded up a vicious gang of thieves. The heavy man is still at large. Your job? Get him. Hello, this is George Fenneman. I want to talk to you about the cigarette that's really on the move. The one everyone's talking about and trying. Chesterfield. First cigarette in America to give you premium quality in both regular and king size. Chesterfield king size is exactly the same quality and exactly the same blend of tobacco as Chesterfield regular size. There is absolutely no difference, except that king size Chesterfield is larger, contains considerably more of the same tobaccos. So much more, it gives you a 21% longer smoke, yet costs very little more. And Chesterfield king size contains better tobaccos, and is of higher quality than any other king-size cigarette. So, sound off for Chesterfield. Either way you like them, regular or king-size, Chesterfield gives you the best possible smoke. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Tuesday, March 6th. It was windy in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out a robbery detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Didion. My name's Friday. It was 2.46 p.m. when I got to room 27A. Robbery. Frank? Yeah, Joe. How about those subpoenas? Took them down to the warrant office. They're going to serve them. Oh, fine. All the follow-ups made, packages in order. That about wraps it up, doesn't it? Yeah, all but Bentley. Yeah, nothing from Mac yet. No, he said he'd call as soon as he heard anything. Yeah, no. He'll be happy when we get him, won't you? He's probably the worst of the lot. Yeah. Well, according to what Mac said, he's in real trouble now. Broke. None of his friends will have any to do with him. We'll turn him. I don't think I'll ever understand a guy like Bentley. What makes a man want to beat somebody just for the sake of beating him? Mm. Figure that, we'll have it made. 32 robberies, and just about every one, Bentley's got to work over at least one of the victims. He's pretty vicious. Mm -hmm. Now we get him this time he's through. Probably knows it, too. You and Mac blows the whistle, probably going to be rough to take, though. Yeah. Joe, I don't know how you feel about it, but I'm happy it's over. And let's face it, we were lucky on this one. The guys were gun happy. Taking any longer to get them, they'd have killed somebody, sure. Yeah, maybe so. Well, on my next day off, I'm going to do nothing but sit, not make a move. My feet are killing me. Yeah, we had a lot of legwork on this one. Not just this one, Joe, all of them. I was reading in the magazine the other day about a new kind of art support. i got to get me a pair of them. Well? Yeah. According to the ad, these are going to be just a ticket. Some new kind of rubber, soft, when they mold it to your feet. Place back in Wisconsin. Well, how do they do it? They got a place here in L.A.? No, just a home office. Just a small place, I guess. According to the ad, the whole process pretty new. Yeah, well, how do you get this? What is it, a mold? Yeah, you stand on a piece of paper, hold a bucket of water in each hand, you know, you put all your weight on your feet. Yeah. And you draw the outline of your foot on the paper. They make the arch thing up from that. Well, if you're holding a bucket of water in each hand, is that right? Yeah. Well, how do you use the pencil? What? Well, a bucket of water in each hand, how are you going to draw? Yeah. I'll get it. Robbery Friday. Oh, hi, F.A. Yeah, he's here. Oh, how are the kids? Oh, yeah, sure, I'll put him right on. Frank, it's for you. Your wife seems upset. Thanks, Joe. Hello, honey. Yeah? yeah I can, but what's up? Well, can't you tell me now? Well, why not? All right, honey, I'll be right there. Don't worry now. Huh? Goodbye. What's the matter? Something wrong? I don't know. If Faye wants me to come right home, says something's going on. Couldn't she tell you about it on the phone? No, it says something about the phone being tapped. <laughs> We went down to the carpool and started over for Frank's house. For the past three months, we'd been working on a case involving a gang that had been operating in the city. During that time, they'd committed 32 armed robberies, and in most instances, they'd beaten their victims for no apparent reason. Their ruthless attitude was the most outstanding single point of their M.O. 
We'd successfully rounded up all members of the gang with one exception, Leroy Bentley, alias the Bull. Bentley was the known heavy man of the gang. In order to successfully prosecute and apprehend any criminal or criminals, the police officer requires the fullest measure of cooperation and assistance that he can obtain from many people, the private citizen and his own associates as well. From the ranks of the private citizen comes one important aid, the informant. The working detective knows that in many cases his most valuable assistance can often come from his informant. In this particular case, we'd received information that would lead us to Bull Bentley within a matter of days. 3.22 p.m. We arrived at Frank's home. I'm glad you're home, honey. I'm awfully worried. No, Joe. Oh, yeah. What's the trouble now? What's this all about this phone being tapped? Well, that's what he said. Who? The man who called. All right, now, honey, can you tell me what this is all about? I got a phone call just before I called you. It was a man. Said his name was Bull Bensler or Bendley. I didn't get it. He said that you thought you were a smart cop, but if you didn't lay off him, he was going to take care of you where it had hurt the most. He threatened the children and me, too. Well, Frank, I don't know what to do. Go on. He said the phone was tapped and we were being watched. Said to tell you he wasn't kidding. He didn't have anything to lose. He sounded real mean. I'm frightened. Do you know this man, Frank? Oh, he is, yeah. We have a warrant for his arrest. Faye, where are the kids? Well, Stacy's in her room playing. I called the school for Mike. The teacher said she dismissed the class. He should be home by now. Frank, I don't know. I'm worried about him. All right, lock the doors. Don't open for anybody. Joe and I will go out and see if we can find Mike. All right, I'm worried sick about him. He should have been home 20 minutes ago. I'll right, go over and call the captain, Frank. Ask him to send a couple of men out, huh? Thanks, Joe. Don't worry about it, Faye. 2511, please. Yeah, robbery. Hello, oh, Glenn. Is the captain there? Yeah, it's Friday. I'd like to talk to him. Skipper, this is Friday. I'm out at Frank's house. Oh, Frank Smith, yeah. Bull Bentley called his wife, threatened her and the kids if he didn't lay off. No, said if he didn't lay off. Well, could you send a couple of men out to stand by? Fine. Mike isn't home from school yet, and Frank... Well, that's his little boy. Frank and I are going out to look for him. Yeah, I said he'd be watching the house. Who? Yeah, swell. All right, we'll be in as soon as we find the boy. Right, Skipper. O'Donnell and Stewart from the office will be out, Faye. They'll park the car down the street. Watch for him and let him in, won't you? All right, Joe. What about it, Frank? You gonna lay off this guy? You want me to? Please find little Mike. All right, honey. We'll find him. Well, lock the door and don't open it for anyone but O'Donnell and Stewart when they get here. All right, dear. Now, don't worry, huh, honey? We'll find him. Yeah. Let's go. Joe, what do you think? I don't know. I'll tell you one thing. Yeah. I'm scared. There are two types of criminals that can be counted on to be dangerous. The youngster who becomes easily panicked at the scene of a crime, and the older criminal who will do anything rather than go back to the penitentiary. Bull Bentley was one of these. We knew that he was more than capable of carrying out his threat. His record was one of armed robbery, vicious beatings, and kidnapping. At this particular time, he was wanted for murder in the state of Colorado. The average criminal will blame anyone but himself for his predicament, usually the police officer, and this was so in Bentley's case. He apparently thought that by getting us off his trail, he could go free. Frank and I searched the area around the house. We found his little boy in a vacant lot two blocks from school playing with a group of youngsters. We put him in the car and returned him to his home. Stuart and O'Donnell were at Frank's house and said they'd stay there until they were relieved. 4.36 p.m. Frank and I checked back into the office. Smith, Friday, in here. Right. Come on in. Find the boy? Yeah, Skipper, out playing with some of the kids in the neighborhood. All right. Now, what's this all about? Well, this bunch we just cleaned up. Yeah? Bull Bentley called Frank's wife and told her that if Frank didn't lay off of him, he was going to get to him through his family. What do you plan to do? Well, no choice. Get him before he can do anything, I guess. Frank? Yes, yeah, Skipper. You like to be taken off this assignment? No, no, it's a personal matter. It's up to you. Let's see that your house is covered when you're not home. You keeping the boy away from school? Yeah, Captain, until this thing's over. You got any ideas where you can pick Bentley up? Well, we've covered all the places he's known to hang out. Want any help? No, not right now. Just find him fast. Well, you know he's in town. Figure he's going to stay here? Well, we don't think he's got much choice. We figure he's broke, he's hot. None of his friends will take a chance on putting him up. He's going to need money. Better cover the bus depots, train depots, alert the airport detail. Get a couple of hundred mugs printed up on him. Yeah. Distribute them to the beat men and radio cars. Contact Captain Hamilton, the intelligence. He might be able to come up with something. Our informant said he could turn Bentley for us in a week. A week's a long time, Joe. Yeah, I know. You've covered all his hangouts. All of them. Nobody's seen him in a couple of days. Just seemed to drop out of sight. Big town, a lot of people. Sometimes you don't realize how big till you start looking for one man. Yeah. 
Want to get in touch with the boys in the press room, give them the story, see if they'll carry Bull's picture. See Jack Ricketts, he'll put the picture on suspects wanted. We'll get started on it right now. You got a silent number, haven't you, Frank? Yeah, it's unlisted. How'd Bentley get it? It had to come from somewhere. Joe and I were talking about that. You know pretty much who we give the numbers out to, but the only one we can figure that'd be in a position to give it to Bentley is Harry McLeod. Your informant? Yeah. How long since you've heard from this McLeod? A couple of days. Figure maybe he'd cross you, throw in with Bentley? Well, it's possible. I don't think so, though. He's leveled with us so far. The number had to come from someplace. Yeah, well, it sure makes it look like McLeod, doesn't it? I don't think Mac would give the number away on his own. Bull could get it. We got 32 people to prove it. Well, we better get on this thing. Come on, Frank. Right. Check you later, Skipper. Joe, I don't know what I'm going to do. Well, don't worry. We'll get to him. No, I mean this two-bit thief calling Faye, threatening her. Try to take it easy. I know how you feel. Why me, Joe? Bull Bentley's brushed up against a hundred different cops in his day. Why me? Law of averages, I guess. You were handy. I knew just what to do. Well, Skipper gave you a choice. If you'd like to go home, nobody'd blame you. You don't know what it is, Joe. You don't have a family. Something like this can split you in two. Half of you wants to be on the job. The other half is pulling you toward home. Joe, if that cheap punk steps to my front porch, I'm going to lean on him hard. Now look, Frank, this isn't going to get us any place. Let's get over to the photo lab and get this thing moving, huh? I could just figure it. 4,000 guys in the department and Bentley has to pick me. Joe, why me? All right, look, Frank. I could try to spell it for you a hundred ways and we still wouldn't come out with any kind of a total. I know what you must be going through, and I'm sorry it's got to be you. I'm sorry it has to be any cop. You're right about me not having a family, but it's squeezing me just as hard as it is you. You and I both knew when we filled out those application blanks what we were taking on. It's the job, Frank. Maybe I never told you before. Maybe you've been through this, too. I don't know. There isn't a day goes by that I'm on the job here that I don't run into something that breaks my heart. Why did Ed Wilson have to get shot down when he and his partner tried to take that guy out of that rooming house over on 8th Street? Why did Olson and his partner have to end up in the PNF ward last week? Why do you have to run the gamut of every human emotion and class of people on earth? Poor to rich, it's all the same. Somebody picks up a gun to knock over the corner gas station, everything hangs in the balance. The minute that thief slips a cartridge into his gun, the gas station attendant, his family, his kids, and every relative he's got slides right onto the short end. Everybody seems to think that wherever crime is concerned, they never get any closer to it than the front page of the morning paper. I know you know this, Frank. For every attempted crime, God only knows how many innocent people are thrown into the balance even before the crime's been committed. That's the way it is, Frank. I'm not trying to tell you anything you don't know, but the minute you passed that exam, you had to make book that something like this could contaminate you just as surely as if you weren't a cop. I guess it's almost a legacy. Nobody's found a vaccine for crime. Nobody's immune. And it's worse with you and me because... We know better than to think we can't be touched. We know we can. We invite it every time we roll on a call, every time we pick somebody up, every time a guy gets out of line. It's the job, Frank. I didn't mean to give you an academy lecture, but if it's any comfort, I'm with you. I know just how you feel, and so do 4,000 other guys right down here. Yeah. I guess maybe we better get moving, huh? Yeah, come on. We took the mug shot of Bentley to the photo lab and asked them to run off 200 copies. We checked with the reporters in the press room, and they promised us full cooperation. Jack Ricketts told us that he'd put the picture on the air the next day. Frank called home and found that there'd been no further calls from Bentley. 6.17 p.m., we started to look for Harry McLeod, our informant. We checked his hotel, but the clerk told us he hadn't been in all afternoon. We started checking his known hangouts. In fear of burning McLeod, we were unable to ask for him by name, which made it necessary for us to canvas each individual place. 9.28 p.m., we located McLeod in a small bar that was known to be frequented by thieves. We walked over to the bar and sat down next to him. We ordered a drink. At the first opportunity, without arousing suspicion, we told McLeod we wanted to talk to him and that we'd meet him down the street two blocks west. We left the bar, got in the car, and drove to the meeting place. Twenty minutes later, McLeod arrived, got in the back seat, and we drove away. Want to get the radio, Joe? Yeah. What's the matter with you guys? I told you I'd get in touch with you and I had something for you. You trying to get me burned? Right, take it easy, Mac. Just a couple of things we want to know. Well, I'm on your side. You guys know that. I've always leveled with you, haven't I? Yeah. Well, then what's this bit? You walk into that joint, you know what goes on in there, and you pull me out. Good chance somebody could have seen you, you know. Yeah, we know, Mac. Have you seen Bentley? No, I told you I'd let you know when I turned him. I don't snow us, Mac. This is important. Have you seen him? If I saw him, I'd have called you. You know that, don't you? I'd have called you guys. I told you once I'd finger him for you. I haven't called. I haven't seen him. It's that simple. What's the big rush about getting Bentley, anyway? He ain't going no place. Now, look, Mac, we got a personal interest in this thing. This isn't just robbery. Bull's been calling Frank's wife, saying he was going to kill her and the kids. You know he'd do it. Now, how about it? I didn't know it was like that. Bull's mean enough to do it, Well, that's too. how it is. Now, I'll ask you once more. Have you seen him? Yeah. When? 
Day before yesterday, Sunday morning. Saw him down Marty's. How come he didn't call us? I couldn't. Honest, I couldn't. He came in and asked me for some dough. I told him I didn't have any. I tried to stall him till I could get to a phone. Yeah? Didn't work. He wouldn't wait. Got mad when I couldn't help him out. He say anything about a meat? Just said he'd get in touch with me. Yeah. He was real sore when I couldn't let him have any dough, but I told him, I said, look, boy, you know I want to help, but I just haven't got it. That's what I said. Yeah. Wasn't kidding either. Things been pretty rough. Say, you guys couldn't see your way clear, could you? Sawbuck to tie me over, huh? Well, you got me at the wrong time, Mac. I'm tapping. How about you, Smith? Hmm? Well, if you gotta have it, I got ten bucks I've been saving for a pair of shoes. Yeah, I sure appreciate it. You guys know that. Yeah, we know. You got any idea how Blow might have gotten Frank's home phone? No, not the slightest. You sure you didn't give it to him? Joe, you've known me for a lot of years. Would I do a thing like that after the way you guys treated me? Well, that's what we're trying to find out, Mac. I should get a little insulted at that. You guys figuring out about Oh, now, come off it, Mac. Did you give him the number? No, I swear to you I didn't. All right. You got any ideas where Bull might be hiding? Not in particular. You check the usual places? Yeah, we looked through them all. And you know as much as I do. He did say he looked me up in a couple of days. You see where he was going when he left you? No, just walked out of Marty's. I saw a friend of his yesterday, though. Yeah. The guy said he'd seen Bull Sunday night. Say what he wanted? Money. Said he'd try to tap him for some dough to get out of town. His friend help him? He didn't give him any money. He gave him something else, though. Yeah. He gave him a gun. You are listening to Dragnet, authentic stories of your police force in action. Chesterfield is the first and only cigarette in America to give you premium quality in both regular and king size. Just as Chesterfield is the first and only cigarette to tell you what it's made of. Yes, Chesterfield names all its ingredients. So you'll know what gives you the best possible smoke. The world's best tobaccos, pre-tested by laboratory instruments for the most desirable smoking qualities. Pure, costly moistening agents. Costly glycerol and pure sugars which are natural to tobacco. And cigarette paper of the highest purity. The best that money can buy. That's what's in your Chesterfield. Ingredients that give you the best possible smoke. Much milder, with an extraordinarily good taste, and, as confirmed by a well-known research organization, no unpleasant aftertaste. So sound off for Chesterfield. Either way you like them, regular or king size, Chesterfield gives you the best possible smoke. Before we left Mac, he furnished us with the name of the man who'd given the gun to Bull Bentley. We recognized the name Dave Slater as a small-time hoodlum who'd do anything to make a dollar as long as he himself was reasonably safe in doing it. Mac told us of several places where we might find him. The most likely place was a pool room on North Main Street. Slater had numerous arrests, most of them for being drunk and for acting as a lookout for gambling games. He was a type of thief that can be found in every large city, always on the fringe of criminal operations but never directly involved in the crime itself. We checked several of the places Mac told us about, but we couldn't come up with Slater. We checked the pool room. The manager was evasive and at first appeared reluctant to talk. We informed him that we knew Slater would be back and that we'd wait for him. The manager asked us to come to the back room with him. He told us that Slater had said that he was going down to the all-night hamburger stand on the corner to get something to eat. We found Slater sitting at the counter. Call this thing a hamburger, all I can see is a bun. I'd be ashamed to sell a thing like this lousy deal 35 cents for nothing. Slater? Yeah, well, something you want? Police officer Slater, we want to talk to you. What about? Bull Bentley. Bentley? Never heard of him. We got information you do know him pretty well. Yeah? You tell your pigeon he's lying, I never heard of the guy. Now, let me finish eating. Now. We want to talk to you, Slater. You want to make it here, or would you rather go downtown? Can't you see I'm eating? Now, let me finish. I got nothing to tell you. I don't know any Bull Bentley. Now, lay off, huh? Come on, you can think better than an empty stomach, Slater. Let's go. Frank and I took Slater out of the restaurant and put him in the car. Once he was in custody, his attitude changed completely. He said he wanted to help us, but that he didn't know Bull Bentley. 10.44, we got back to the city hall. I want to stop by the office, Joe. Call home. All right, I'll be in the interrogation room. You tell us, Skipper. Yeah. In here, Slater. Yeah. Sit down. Sure. Look, I told you I want to help you guys out, but honest, I don't know anything. If I did, I'd let you know. All right, come off it, Slater. Where's Bentley? Look, I keep telling you, I don't know any Bentley. Where are you living now? Solly Hotel, West Fifth. How long you been there? A couple of days. You working now? Yeah, a little. Odd job now and then. You know, nothing steady. What do you call an odd job, Slater? Oh, you know, sweep out the pool room, rack the balls for him. Yeah, sure. Now, look, we've known you for eight years. You never worked a day in that time. 
Now, how about Bentley? We got a personal interest in him. We want him. We want him bad. Look, I tell you, I don't know any Bentley. Anything new? Yeah, Joe, he called a couple more times tonight. Last time at 10.30, scared Faye half to death. Yeah. Said he knew Mike was home. He knew we were looking for him. Said if we don't stop, it'll get to the kids. Said it didn't matter how many cops we had around the house, he'd get to them. Faye's almost hysterical. O'Donnell called the doctor. Yeah. How about Slater? He come up with anything? No. Still says he doesn't know him. Doesn't know him, huh? Listen, punk, let's you and me get straightened out. What happens to me is one thing. What happens to my family is another. They don't pay me enough money to jeopardize my family. Now you get this straight. When punks like you and your trigger-happy friends can threaten my family, then something's got to give, and it's not going to be me. Yeah, but I told you... Look, wipe that silly grin off your face, Slater. You feel nice and safe there, don't you? You know, as long as you're in custody, we got to take care of you. Well, maybe you'd like to know that if I have to, I'll take this badge off and walk up one side of you and down the other. Now, I want to know where Bentley is, and I want to know now. We're not stumbling around in the dark. We know you gave him a gun. Let me tell you this, mister. Mark it down. If anything happens to my wife or my kids, you can't run fast enough to get away because I'll nail you hard. All right, Frank. He's getting pretty tough, isn't he? He's just telling you how you stand. Now, come on, where's Bentley? I told you, I don't know Bentley. All right. Let's get everything out of your pockets. Get it on the table. Well, there's nothing much. Uh, yeah, change, keys, yeah, and a nail file, address book, my handkerchief, comb, wallet, yeah, cigarettes, and matches. That's all. I'm going to shake him down, Frank. Yeah. I told you that's all. all right, now, what are you looking still. for? Now, push your luck, Slater. It's clean, Joe. How much money you got in your wallet? I don't know. Double sawbuck, maybe? It's a funny thing. You guys never work, but you always got money. All right, take the money out and count it, Slater. Why? What's that going to prove? Take it out and count it. All right. 10, 20, 25, 26, 27, 37, another five. 42 bucks. I didn't know I had that much. All right. Put the money in your pocket. That all the money in your wallet? Yeah, that's it. Let's see the wallet. Here. Yeah. There's nothing in it. A couple of cards, that's all. Yeah. Let's see here. A couple of pawn tickets. Picture. Who's the girl? Babe, I met in Dago. You don't know her. She's not in the rackets. Married now. I haven't seen her in a year. Then why are you carrying her picture? I always kind of liked her. She had class. Real nice broad. You said you didn't know Bo Bentley? That's what I said. How about Leroy Bentley? Nah. You know anybody at all named Bentley? Look, I told you I don't know any Bentley. How many times do I have to tell you? You know anybody by the name of Bull? I don't know anybody named Bull. I don't know anybody named Bentley. Yeah. Take a look, Joe. Hmm. Now, maybe you can explain this then. Yeah, what's that? Bar tab in your wallet. His name Bull written on it. How about it, Slater? Who's Bull? I don't remember that. Probably something I picked up a long time ago. I, I don't remember it. Tab's dated March 4th, day before yesterday. Your memory must be getting pretty bad, huh? I got nothing to say. Well, Frank, you want to check the business office and see who this number is listed to? Yeah, Joe, right away. All right, fine. I'm going to tell you something, boy. This is a rotten deal. The law protects people like you. You're lying. We know it, and you know it, too. You know Bentley. You know where he is. What's more, we know you gave him a gun Sunday night, the same date on that tab. I'll tell you what we're going to do, Slater. You're a real wise guy. You talk fast. We're going to get Bull. Maybe not tonight, maybe not tomorrow, but we'll get him. And when we do, we're going to tell him that you blew the whistle on him. We're going to put him in the same cell with you. I'd like to hear you talk your way out of that. Well, you wouldn't do that. Don't make book on it. Look, he's a mean guy. He'll kill me. Thought you didn't know him. All right, so I know him. But you wouldn't do that. Would you put me in with him? Where is he, Slater? You going to tell him I turned him in? We're making no deals. Where is he? I don't know where he is now. You know where he'll be? Yeah, I, I was supposed to meet him there tonight at the bar down on West 7th. He's got a friend who works there, feeds him. He'll be there tonight, huh? Yeah, I said if I'd meet him, he'd pay me for the gun, 75 bucks. What kind of gun is it? A 38. It's a good one, too. Worth more than 75 bucks, but I needed the money. Where'd you get the gun? Well, you'll find out anyway. I might as well tell you. Prowled the car, found under the seat. I found out later it belonged to a guy in the vice squad. Probably real sore about it. Could be, Joe. Barn, West 7th, place called the Hamilton Inn. Yeah, that's it. He'll be there. All right, Slater, let's go. Well, where are you taking me? You're going to jail. No, you can't win. Should have known you. Hey, do me a favor, huh? What's that? Talk to the jailer, make him give me a cell by myself. We handcuffed Slater to a chair in the robbery office until we got back to book him. 12.32 a.m., Frank and I left the city hall for the Hamilton Inn on West 7th Street. Slater had told us that he was to meet Bull Bentley between 1 and 1.30. When we got there, there were a half a dozen people in the place. We checked the bar and the men's restroom, but Bentley wasn't around. 
We went back to the car, drove down the street to a closed service station and parked where we could keep both doors of the restaurant under surveillance. 12.50, 1 a.m., 1.15. We waited. 1.35. Joe, that him? I don't know. It might be. Let's take a look. All right, you want to take the side door? I'll try the front. Right. All right. I don't see him, Joe. Wait a minute. Is that him? Going in the phone booth back there? Yeah. All right, come on. I'll get him. Yeah. Watch it, Joe! Watch it, Frank! All right, Frank. I'll shake him down. Who told you? Who blow the whistle? That bum McLeod, it was him. He was the only one who knew. He gave you my telephone number? Yeah, he did. And he runs to you and cops out. Should have known better. I give him 20 bucks for it. Well, that figures. What do you mean? We gave him 10 not to. The story you have just heard was true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On June 12th, the hearing was held in the district attorney's office. In a moment, the results of that hearing. Now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you, George Fenneman. Friends, I'd like to talk to you about something that's important to every one of you. Now, for the first time, you can get a premium quality cigarette in either regular or king size. Of course, that's Chesterfield. Both regular and king size Chesterfields are made of the proven ingredients that give you the best possible smoke. Both are much milder, with an extraordinarily good taste and no unpleasant aftertaste. Yes, there's no difference between the two, except king-size Chesterfield is larger, contains so much more of the same tobaccos, it gives you a 21% longer smoke, yet it costs very little more. So remember, either way you like them, regular or king-size, Chesterfield gives you the best possible smoke. <laughs> Roy W. Bentley was released to the Colorado authorities for prosecution on a charge of murder. A hold was placed on him for the state of California in the event he is paroled. He was convicted and is now serving a life sentence in the Colorado State Penitentiary without possibility of parole. Although David R. Slater was guilty of aiding and abetting a felony, a complaint could not be issued due to the fact it could not be proved that Slater knew Bentley was an ex-convict when he gave him the gun. He was filed on for petty theft in Division 7. He pled guilty and was sentenced to 90 days in the county jail. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Technical advisors, Captain Jack Donahoe, Sergeant Marty Wynn, Sergeant Vance Brasher. Heard tonight were Herb Ellis, June Whitley, Jack Crucian. Script by John Robinson. Music by Walter Schumann. Hal Gibney speaking. These great programs sound off for Chesterfield. Radio. Dragnet, the Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis show, and every weekday Arthur Godfrey time. On television. Dragnet, Gangbusters, Arthur Godfrey and his friends, and the Perry Como show. Tomorrow, you'll want to sound off for Chesterfield. Because either way you like them, regular or king size, Chesterfield gives you the best possible smoke. Chesterfield has brought you Dragnet, transcribed from Los Angeles. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.